Hi, this is Michael Uslin. You're listening to Batman on Film. I'm vengeance. I have given a name to my pain. Welcome to episode number 99 of the Batman on Film Social Hour podcast. I am the founder of Batman on Film, Bill Ramey, and with me today is a very special guest, the executive producer and the originator of the Batman film franchise, Michael Uslan. Michael is here today to talk about his new Batman story that will be found in Tales from Earth 6, A Celebration of Stan Lee, which is a commemorative one-shot anthology featuring new stories based on Lee's along with Michael's interpretations of core DC characters from his Just Imagine series of one-shots back in 2001 and 2002. It will hit comic book stores and participating digital platforms on Tuesday, December 27th. So without further ado, here's Michael to talk about he and Stan Lee's version of Batman in this brand new story. Well, Mr. Yu, how are you, sir? I'm really good, Bill. Uh, I heard you talk about your trip. I know you told me you were going uh, Middle East, so that sounds exciting. Yeah, I was there two months ago. Uh, we we did a, a, a vacation, really, in uh, Israel, Egypt, and Greece. Yes. And uh, to go back now, I'm giving a keynote address at the Red Sea Film Festival, and we've got a lot of financing meetings coming up. Um, there is a growing, growing, growing percentage of people who are superhero fans and comic book fans and superhero movie and animation and gaming fans all over the world. And um, one of the things that I found, you know, you, I think you know this story. I've been fortunate enough three times to have uh, lectured at the United Nations. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first two times yes. did it is a dog and pony show with Jerry Robinson, who uh, co-created the Joker, Robin, Alfred, and so many other great Batman characters. And what we found when we lectured to people from all the countries of the Middle East was that our comic books and our pop culture, our superheroes are capable of bonding us, of showing all of our similarities as opposed to the differences that are always highlighted by the media and by politicians. And um, it was an incredible uh, few sessions that we did there. Very, very warm and fuzzy. Uh, Everybody taking selfies, promising to stay in touch, despite the fact we all came from different cultures, different Mm -hmm. politics, different religions. Um, it, it, It was a wonderful experience to see the power of comic books and the power of superheroes. Speaking of the power of comic books, I know, I know that you have a long friendship and all sorts of different dynamics to your relationship with Stan Stan Lee. So can you just speak to that just for the history of it for folks who may not know sure. how tight y'all were? Yeah. And I'll try to do the less than three hour version of this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I first met Stan when I was 11 years old. Fantastic Four number nine had come out. They had just been thrown out of the Baxter building, their headquarters, because they went bankrupt. And I said to my mom, I want to see the Baxter building in New York. We lived an hour outside Mm -hmm. of New Jersey. So she took me and my friend Bobby to New York. One day we were off from school, took us on a DC comics tour. So it had to be a Tuesday afternoon. We're walking around downtown. Nobody knows where the Baxter building is. Cop didn't know. She went and into one of these old fashioned things called a phone booth that had this big yellow book in it called the yellow pages and looked up Marvel Comics and got Stan Lee's assistant, Flo Steinberg, on the phone. And she said, we're desperately looking for the Baxter building. Maybe you can help me. And Flo, who was one of the dearest people on the planet, said, oh, Mrs. Uslan, I'm so sorry, but the Baxter building was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and it's not real. 
And my mother said, oh, no, my boys are going to be so disappointed. We drove here all the way from New Jersey. And Flo said, oh, well, why don't you bring the boys up here to Marvel? Um, we, are, uh, we are at 655 Madison Avenue, and I'll show them around. So up we went to Marvel. And not only did she show us around, she introduced us to Stanley and Jack Kirby. And they signed my copy of All Winners number 18 that I had with me. And that was it. Stan Lee was my idol. He was my idol. Years later, when I was about 19 years old, uh, I started teaching the world's first college accredited course on comic books. And I did it at Indiana mm -hmm. University. And it got lots of publicity. Mm -hmm. And Stan calls me out of the blue one day and says, Michael, I'm watching you on TV talk shows. I'm reading about you in newspapers. What you're doing with your course at Indiana is great for the whole comic book industry. How can I help you? And on that day, Stan Lee became my mentor. Over the years, we became friends. When he started um, Marvel Animation, he brought me in and we collaborated together as creative partners on a syndicated show called The Marvel Universe, which ultimately did not uh, sell, did not go mm -hmm. forward. Um, but we worked on that together. We worked on a few things together. And um, when the day came, when Marvel was in trouble financially, um, I went to the people at Smith Barney in, uh, on Wall Street and said, hey, we got to buy this company. This company's in distress. I know exactly what to do with it. So having spent three days and three nights with the trustees in Newark, New Jersey, and reading everything Marvel had, I also read Stan's contract and saw that he had one golden out. There was one thing he could choose to do outside of Marvel that he had carte blanche to do. Well, knowing that, I went to Stan and said, listen, what about me bringing you over to DC Comics and you reinventing all the DC comic book superheroes the way you would have created them at Marvel? And I would guarantee you, I will line up the greatest art artists in history, living legends, and some really new hotshot up and comers. And Stan laughed at me. He said, oh, don't be ridiculous, Michael. DC would never go for it. Um, you know, would, uh, would, um, uh, would Henry Ford go over to General Motors and design Chevrolets? It, it just yeah. wouldn't happen. So I went to Paul Levitz, who then was the president of DC Comics and an old friend since we were 16, 17 years old. And Paul said, my God, Michael, this would be so much fun. Let's do it. And went back to Stan. We negotiated a pretty quick deal. And um, Mike Carlin came aboard as our editor. And um, this was 20 years ago now. And we had mm -hmm. a ball. We worked together for 13 months on the project. And it was just spectacular. As a wrap up to my relationship with Stan, um, when Stan passed away, my son David and I were two of the producers of his memorial at Grauman's Chinese Theater. And it was a send off that was absolutely unbelievable that I kicked off outside Grauman's Chinese Theater with a mass of people. The street was blocked off. And I brought up Jack Kirby's granddaughter, uh, Steve Ditko's nephew and said, there is no way Stan would want any kind of a memorial to proceed unless the Ditko's and the Kirby's were there to share the spotlight, even at this particular moment in time. And everybody embraced and it, it, was, a, it was a magical moment. Fantastic. So what was the, how did the creative process go with, come, with doing his version of Batman? Well, the first thing that happened is Mike and I had to introduce him to all the characters and lay out a menu for him that he could potentially okay. select. And I tried to guide him as best as I could. Uh, for example, I pointed out, you know, Stan, here you have Aquaman and Aquaman could be like your water version of the human torch. Mm. Um, it, there were some that were natural and immediate, like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, uh, Flash and Green Lantern. That was automatic. Uh, but then he wanted to do Shazam because he wanted to take a monster con concept like his Atlas um, uh, monster books and incorporate it into the superhero genre. So he thought Shazam was a good one to do mm. that with. Um, with Wonder Woman, he threw in a bit of his Thor and mythology, although switching over to Mayan mythology, um, mm -hmm. more than anything. 
Um, with Sandman, it was a, a bit of Doctor Strange incorporated into it. So, you know, each one he saw, he could bring something a bit different to the specific character. And I'll tell you, Bill, he was, he was 20 years ahead of his time. Because if you look at the world today, and the fact that Stanley created a Black Batman, a Hispanic Wonder Woman, a Hispanic mm -hmm. Aquaman, a female Flash, um, his Shazam had a lot of Indian elements to it. Uh, Robin, a Latino, um, he, he was way ahead of his time and he, yeah. he never wanted it to feel retro. He wanted to be contemporary. He always did. The What is the, because I know, because I've read the stories and I read the new one, I want to get to that in a second, but what, what would you say are the, the similarities that Wayne Williams has with Bruce Wayne and what is different? about their their Batman and their alter egos? Well, we have to start with the fact that Wayne Williams comes from a poverty background. And he his is the struggle of the everyday person who is suppressed mm -hmm. and repressed in our society. Um, Bruce Wayne came from vast wealth. Yes. So you, you start with that one basic difference. Culturally, their worlds couldn't have been more completely different. But Stan understood that the, the concept of Batman is more as a symbol. And it's more about one individual who's willing to sacrifice everything and make a commitment to stand up and do what's right. And that it doesn't matter what your cultural background is, doesn't matter um, who you are specifically, male, female, um, for, from any kind of background, anybody who is willing to do these things in the interests of justice, they can be Batman because mm -hmm. that's exactly what Batman stands for. So he wanted to make sure to include that. Um, his values are the same. He's incorruptible. Mm -hmm. He's incorruptible. And he's willing to take on the powerful um, and, and do so relentlessly. So I think that there's there's a common bond there. And what is the bond? What do you describe it as? I think it can be described as, as it's his humanity. You know, I mean, I always yes. contend that, that Batman's greatest superpower for a non-superpowered guy, his greatest superpower is his humanity. And I think that's reflected in the Wayne Williams story. There are some things that are different, but are like, the um, just imagined version of the DC, the traditional Batman. Um, he ends up, he does end up wealthy from the wrestling and there is a mansion eventually, but then the roles kind of switch because it's like Frederick is supposed to be the rich guy and Wayne Williams is the, the well, not the butler in this case, but the chauffeur, bodyguard, I should say. But Frederick is, in my, in my interpretation, Frederick is kind of the Alfred to Wayne Williams. Yeah, Frederick was originally conceived by Stan uh, to be, I guess the, the modern day word would be Yoda. Uh, okay. to, he, he would be the guy to help train him, to mm -hmm. give him the tools that he needs to succeed, um, who recognizes his drive, who yes. recognizes what's motivating him. And while... Yes, there's the reference there, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's take a ride into town, uh, mm -hmm. which I have in mind. It's, it's not that he is being treated like Alfred. Yes. Um, Alfred, if you, if you pierce into it, and I did a deep dive in this in a Batman hardback graphic novel I wrote years ago called Batman Detective Number 27, mm -hmm. where Alfred was a full partner yeah. in their endeavor a full partner in their endeavor. And he played a role the same way Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne played the playboy role. Alfred kind of played his role as well. Yes, and, I, and I think a lot of that came through in Stan's interpretation. Yes. Of Wayne and Frederick. That's certainly what I, the way I took it because it is become more uh, today with Batman and Alfred that ba Alfred is not only the father figure, but he's, he's been the, he's the, the partner He's the mentor. He is everything he needs to be for Bruce Wayne and for Batman. So um, in the new story, 
um, I found it interesting that there is no Commissioner Gordon, but there kind of is a is a version of Commissioner Gordon who is a classic DC character. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, in Stanley's Catwoman, when he did that twenty years ago, mm -hmm. um, Joni Jordan, you're introduced to her father, and it's also prevalent in Darwin Cook's backup story, uh, which introduces us to Stan's version of Black Canary. Um, that her father is a ex cop, um, and his he's Hal Jordan, and you know she Catwoman yeah. is Joni Jordan. So I have to I have to specify that making her father's first name Hal in that story was something I suggested to Stan. Okay, he, he didn't know all the details. I said, yeah, you know, if you call him Hal, that's who Green Lantern is. And go, oh 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 yeah, great idea. Yeah. Um, so here in the Batman story that I wrote, picking it up from Stan, um, I had them bringing back Hal Jordan as the police commissioner mm -hmm. to help clean up Gotham City in, in light of the, the influence of the 100. And uh, so while we don't have in Stan Lee's universe, in the Staniverse, we don't have Commissioner Gordon, we do have Commissioner Jordan. Jordan, yes. And there's... Um... The, the, the villain is an interesting take on one of Batman's, well, Batman's arch nemesis. So your thoughts on that? There was sir. absolutely no doubt in my mind, as I was putting together the story for the new edition, it was like Stan, he, he wasn't just looking over my shoulder. He was sitting on my shoulders, looking down at, 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 as I was typing. This is absolutely something he would have done absolutely yeah. something he would have done so i said okay our villain has to be a serial killer and he's a serial killer who strangles his victims so what do the newspapers call him the choker yes i mean that is so stan um he's got to be laughing wherever he yeah. is. he's got to be laughing and there is an he he does um there's a line in there of dialogue about um it comes right for it's got to be it's a nod to batman 89 a little bit yes it is. yeah <laughs> yes so i don't know if i want to give it away or not and let people who read the story find out but it was it, i did I, I i chuckled and got a big smile out of that when it when it happened and i felt like the the new story was very much not only batman taking on the, uh this version of his arch enemy which i'm a maybe down the line we'll get more of that but um, but also the building the relationship between Batman and in this case, Commissioner Jordan. And which, and, which ends with a flip. Yes. Uh, in the last yes, round. Exactly. Uh, with, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I knew Stan was never uh, content with just paralleling what was done in the traditional DC mm -hmm. heroes he was reinventing. He always looked for ways to just flip it. <clears throat> and I and I felt that that last panel was the right kind of Stanley subtle yeah. that could flip it. I really like that. And so I, I'll just end with this. Um, what do you see the future of, of uh, Earth-6 and this Batman? More adventures coming? Would you? I thought, and this is just me, throwing it out there, it would make a great animated DC film to do some of these Stan Lee imaginations of, of DC characters. Um, and also, I, I'd like to see where this story goes from where it ended with your new story. Well, I will tell you right now, point blank, because Stan told me this in the last months of his life, he had on his bucket list, he wanted to see this in animation. Mm. And he felt it was geared for animation, that yeah. the concept of a Stan Lee's Batman, Stan Lee's Superman, Stan Lee's Justice League, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, that this could be very viable and very commercial globally. So that was always on his radar. By the way, the other thing that was on his bucket list, he always wanted to do a cameo in a DC movie. And literally, mm. yeah. just months before he passed, thanks to a great guy at Warner Animation, Sam Register, uh, we were able to get Stan to do an animated cameo in Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Mm -hmm. And if you've yes. never seen this very clever 
uh, mm -hmm. animated film, which is written on two levels, one yeah. for kids, one for fans. Stan does a couple of cameos that are absolutely hysterical. Yep. So the fact that we were able to do that for Stan in the, in the closing moments of his life uh, were so important to, to all of us. Uh, but he wanted to see these in animation. I would love to see that happen. I'd love to see more comic book adventures. And this is the test. We'll see how this edition does. Um, but understand this about it. Because it's Stan Lee and Stan Lee's interpretations, this is a talent magnet. This is drawing talent in some of the greatest writers in comic books, some of the greatest artists in comic books. Whether you're talking about the legends or the hotshots today are drawn to this and want to have an opportunity to take a crack at it. So if you've got the talent level that's willing to come in and do it um, and keep it contemporary and not let it go retro, which would have been against Stan's wishes, Mm -hmm. uh, but but still have that Stanley glow to it. I, I think it's it, I think it's something that um, could could be very very successful in years to come. But the reception to this book is going to be sure. signpost. Well, you've got Batman on film support, and uh, it's Batman on film. So, you know, maybe we'll bang the drum for an animated Stanley Batman or Stanley uh, Earth Six Justice League movie. I appreciate you talking to me about this, and uh, I'm, I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to, uh, for everybody to read it, so congratulations. Thank you so much, Bill, and, and remember, not only did Stan reinvent Batman, but he did reinvent Robin and Catwoman, yes. yep. uh, so, so there's a lot of Batman elements in there just waiting to be explored further. It is. All right, guys, thank you very much. Thanks, pal. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the BOF Social Hour, Jet's official vlog and podcast on Batman on Film. Follow Jet on Twitter, at Batman on Film. Follow the BOF News Feed on Twitter, at The Batman on Film. For Jet and everyone at BOF, I'm announcer Rachel. Authoritative, definitive, the original. Batman on Film, established in 1998.